My talk today will be divided in four main sections. Um, we will start with an introduction uh, where I will basically cover um, why does SKFC believe that uh, the digital twin is a must. And I will then take you through two sections dedicated to SK Virtual Seal product and an SK Virtual Seal production before concluding uh, my presentation and be ready for um, questions that you might have. You probably know SKF if you're joining us today, you probably know SKF as a bearing and a bearing unit uh, supplier. However, we are also uh, present in more than 40 industries around the world, supplying our customers with seals, lubrication management system, condition monitoring, and also services. When it comes to seals particularly, um, um, the challenges that are present are usually related to sealing materials that are depicting viscoelastic behavior with strong dependency on temperature and frequencies, but also very important, um, let's say, um, chemical dependency uh, on uh, the media that uh, they are present with, and also some aging and wear behavior that are to be for sure taken into account in order to, to be able to predict properly the performance of a sealing system. We also have counterfaces that are um, in a present in application, of course, and uh, on which we see uh, a lot of uh, raising sliding speed for the sliding contact of the seal, especially, for example, with electrical vehicle uh, trends and uh, the need of the market going towards higher power density. Um, the other part that are of course uh, challenging are the lubricants uh, with uh, different various uh, complex oil with different type of uh, additives but also greases with very complex rheologies. We also see the environment of course very versatile, very changing uh, with uh, harsher uh, operating fields uh, and a larger temperature range to be covered. Finally, in order to be to be able to respond to these challenges, um, our sealing product um, are of uh, of a certain diversity with different type of uh, lip geometries, lip pumping features, and lip let's say sealing aids that uh, make this vari this variety also a challenging aspect. Despite all these challenges, the seals are expected to fulfill four main functions, let's say that are pretty standard: retain the lubricant, separate two different medias, seal under pressure, and exclude dirt and moisture. And of course, we are expected by our customers uh, to be able to fulfill this main task uh, at the lower cost and with low, higher and higher, let's say, uh, requirement for lower frictions in application for our seals. Despite these challenges, the typical workflow that we see for our product is very much uh, is very much transactional. Um, for seals in general, not just for our product, where we usually see these main uh, steps involve from innovation all the way to application with a clear split um, for, uh, let's say, products that are pretty standard and usually coming from catalog request. We then usually start right from the production since the innovation and prototyping and validation step have already been covered. And here we talk about standard design, well-known products that are usually uh, allowing to go fast in the responsiveness to our customers, but nonetheless uh, still um, are with having to withstand dynamic condition in application leading to most of the time unknown service life that also leads uh, ultimately to regular maintenance needed and reactive assistance. When it comes to non-standard requests however, uh, the challenge is uh, somewhat uh, higher uh, since innovation prototyping and validation step then uh, become a must. And here for innovation we see uh, typically for SEALs, uh, the general common practice is to have innovation based on a lot of experience and uh, with limited, uh, let's say, virtual capabilities. This then leads to a lot of trial and error, long time to market and so forth. The prototyping usually also for new solutions then involve new processes, new material to reach, let's say, uh, different requirements than with our standard products. And in absence of virtual prototyping, we then see usually corrective feasibility taking place, uh, leading to high cost. Finally, validation steps are to be involved uh, before pushing the design forward to production, and this can happen in different manners. But usually we see uh, a common practice is to have endurance testing, uh, where sometimes new test requirements and new test equipments are needed, leading to testing loop that are basically translating to a slow process and expensive overhead. Ultimately, this innovative process and new material make it all the way to production for non-standard requests, leading to high part cost and time quality issues that are ultimately leading, in fact, also for catalog requests on time to high downtown risk and high ownership cost for our customers. 
In SKF, however, we believe in a different in a different way of uh, dealing with our product. We believe that uh, basically we should have a value that uh, uh, two value proposition where we believe the need of our customers are somewhere between a pure product uh, transactional supply uh, all the way to assistance and collaboration, ensuring the let's say maximization of performance in real time by having the right condition monitoring, the right predictive maintenance, and having basically a closer um, collaboration with our uh, customers so that we can basically prevent from being reactive and make sure that the, the cost of ownership and the downtime time uh, are reduced uh, to a minimum. In SKF Seals, in order to achieve this vision, we believe in the digital twin, which is the title of this presentation today. And what we have in mind is really to approach the problem, and I should probably change to a pointer for visualization. And what we believe here is that uh, we should have virtual platforms in place that allows to anticipate the behavior of our products, uh, in this case seals, but also of our production uh, means. Whether for say, for example, we are talking about injection or compression molding for seals. So based on customer requirement, being able to uh, virtually uh, predict the performance of our product as far as uh, fulfilling customer requirements in application are concerned, and then we don't then talk about advanced simulation for virtual seals, but also being able to overlay this type of uh, prediction together with virtual production capabilities, allowing us to uh, reach higher efficiency and ultimately mean, find the right set of parameters for the right quality at the right cost, still meeting the requirement. We then um, uh, believe that this is then to be connected with real production, having loops, feedback loops and corrective loops between virtual production and real production, allowing to then push this uh, optimized set of parameters towards uh, the real manufacturing processes, and then using our virtual performance prediction tools um, to in order to have real-time adjustment via, like I was saying before, predictive maintenance and not uh, so much reactive assistance and uh, let's say waiting until failure to be able to, su to support our customers. Of course, another aspect of that is to be able to use feedback the real seal uh, via remote monitoring, for example, in order to be able to um, use our virtual seals as a virtual test bench, if you will, to in order to also be able to have, uh, let's say, um, predictive assistance and, and anticipating uh, early potential failures without having to wait for a catastrophic um, failures in application. And only by combining all these aspects do we believe that we can then talk about digital twin product, digital twin manufacturing process, and ultimately to digital twin performance, where we judge the performance, as you can see here, not only on the performance of the product in application per se, but also about the efficiency of our production leading to that actual product at the right quality and at the right cost. We then believe that by combining this in a cloud-based platform, certain people call this the Internet of Things, uh, we then can achieve, um, let's say, the right uh, supply of knowledge and uh, of assistance to our customer through product, but also through, uh, let's say, equipment performance as SKF sees it in its vision. Today, I would like to specifically focus on virtual seals and uh, the virtual production and uh, where basically we will discuss about uh, the effort that SKF, has put, SKF Seals has put recently in order to be able to have a virtual test bench in place predicting the performance of the product in application, but also talking about virtual production where we can anticipate the behavior, um, let's say, of our different manufacturing process in place. So let's start with the virtual uh, seal product. Um, usually when I'm being asked uh, why do we need simulation or why, do, uh, why is it so crucial to have, uh, let's say, virtual capabilities in uh, an industry such as sealing, uh, I like to go back to the 16th century and to refer to the experiment of Galileo, who uh, in an attempt to contradict, uh, let's say, the theory of Aristotle, uh, who was claiming that the descent of uh, two balls, uh, let's say, a launch from a certain height was dependent on their mass, went to the Tower of Pisa in Galileo and then rip, uh, did an experiment by those two balls from the, this Tower of Pisa uh, in order to to demonstrate that uh, the diatomic descent was indeed not dependent of their mass. Uh, the gravity force, uh, of course, um, as a function of the acceleration and the mass, but the time of descent was absolutely independent of the mass of the balls. And when I discuss about this experiment, I then try to explain the complexity that uh, comes with uh, rubber materials, or let's say sealing materials in general. And here, uh, I would like to take a minute uh, together with uh, the, our dear attendees to basically reflect a little bit about uh, the following question. What would happen if we, would to be, we, we were to be dropping two balls of same size in this case uh, to basically uh, make the example 
little bit easy from the same um, Tower of Pisa at ambient temperature. We would then use one ball that is made of, let's say, FK material uh, that has a glass transition temperature or about minus 14 degrees centigrade and another ball of HNBR, for example, um, that has a temperature, a glass transition temperature of minus 30 degrees centigrade. Then I would like to ask the following question, just for a little bit of reflection. Uh, which ball hits the ground first? If we believe the experiment of Galileo, then we should know uh, the answer to that question. However, uh, if I start asking which ball stops bouncing first, or if I start asking which ball bounces the highest, then things become a little bit less trivial. And it becomes even more complex if I basically ask to replicate the experiment in an environment where the temperature would be raised to 100 degrees centigrade. So this is why I believe we need simulation, because if we have the right material models, especially for polymers, we are there in our tools, in our virtual tools, able to predict such a behavior. Um, here, what we can see is basically the experiment uh, of which I based the question uh, on the previous slide. And I would like to just demonstrate what exactly happens. In fact, the two balls are hitting the floor uh, at the same time. And we can see that the, the blue ball in this case that has a uh, lowest glass transition temperature uh, is bouncing the highest and bouncing the longest at ambient temperature. However, however, the misconception here is to believe that this is due to the glass transition temperature. In fact, it is not. Uh, it would be uh, a mistake to base this on the glass transition temperature. It is simply the ratio of the loss factor, the loss, uh, sorry, the loss modulus over the, um, let's say, elastic modulus of the rub in that condition, commonly called uh, the loss factor or the 10 delta. And uh, relating to this, we can then predict, after the, having done the right material modeling, why is the HNBR material reacting in such a way versus the FKM material. What is also interesting is to pay attention to what a quasi-static typical finite element analysis would provide. Basically, no difference between the balls, telling us that we definitely need to take into account the transient dynamics of the rubber if we are to be able to predict properly the ceiling system performance. Finally, to answer the question at 100 degrees centigrade, what is very interesting is to see that the two balls then suddenly behave very similarly. And this is because, of course, the loss factor uh, shifted at uh, a higher temperature um, is nonlinear. And then what happens is that the two balls then um, depict a similar loss factor for that temperature, leading to the uh, result that we see on the board or that we see on the, on, on the slide. So it becomes very clear here that uh, understanding rubber transition dynamics uh, with the effect of strain temperature and frequency is uh, is a must because the understanding of this viscoelasticity and the effect of strain temperature and frequency uh, allows to capture uh, the, the very nature of the rubber response and this is of course um, uh, paramount for anybody that wants to understand uh, in details and with accuracy uh, how seals react in dynamics. In fact, seals are very, uh, very seldomly, uh, let's say, in static condition, uh, at least for the rotating equipment, because we they are most like they are most of the time submitted to what I call typical misalignment condition, such as, for example, STBM, uh, that stands for shaft to bore misalignment, where we have a static offset between uh, the uh, center of the shaft or the rotating shaft and the center of the seal. In this case, what then happened is that uh, during uh, basically the rotation, the shaft will uh, continuously run with an eccentricity in place uh, versus the shaft versus the seal, leading to a tendency, depending on temperature and frequency, to basically have a higher gap in the area where we have less interference. The interference between being the difference between the shaft diameter, uh, inner diameter, uh, outer diameter, sorry, and the seal inner diameter. It becomes even more complex when we talk about dynamic runouts. Dynamic runout standing for um, uh, rotating offset between the shaft and the seal axis. In this case, the uh, let's say eccentered center of the shaft actually rotates uh, over time, making the response of the seal to this dynamic condition a little bit a little bit more tricky, a little bit more challenging. And finally, uh, we have the angular misalignment, where basically the uh, called also cocking misalignment, where we have an angular offset between the shaft and seal axis. And here also, uh, that is a condition um, that can be challenging for our, our seals, if not properly anticipated and properly designed for this. For this. Uh, so we've been putting a lot of effort based on this understanding of our viscoelastic materials and the different dynamic condition and transient effect happening in our application into developing what I call the SKF virtual seal. And uh, here we are, uh, I'm giving an example of uh, how we are capable of predicting transient dynamic 
um, in this case on a very simple example. And we can see um, back to the ball example uh, of Galileo earlier that for a temperature of 15 degrees centigrade, we didn't see that despite the dynamic runout here in place, we see basically that the contact force or here in this case, the contact pressure uh, is uh, above the zero line telling us that the seal remains in contact as we can see on this picture. However, as the temperature uh, is reduced uh, to minus 15 degrees centigrade, suddenly we see an area where the, the contact pressure in this case drops to zero um, in, a, in a very, um, with a certain period, telling us that there are uh, time over the rotation where the seal, as can be seen here, is losing contact with the shaft. This, of course, is important uh, for us as this can lead to uh, tremendous uh, issues in application, uh, which we will see in the, in the course of this presentation. So this um, capability has been uh, developed uh, by SKF SEALs uh, in combination uh, with um, basically the FEA provider Abacus, where we integrate our material models into uh, their software commercial packages. With this capability uh, ad on advanced simulation, it was important to also be able to predict analytically the same type of uh, the same type of response of the seal uh, submitted to, to trench and dynamic conditions. Since, as we are talking about real-time adjustment of uh, our let's say customer application, we need of course to be able to respond on the fly uh, to certain inputs from the application to understand exactly what is happening in real time. So sometimes advanced calculation like the one I just finished presenting are a bit too much time consuming and the time being too high and it's important to be able to predict uh, analytically uh, in a very rapid manner the prediction, the behavior of our seals in application. So I want to take a moment to explain what do we see here. Um, we have on the y-axis on this uh, so-called diagram and the for loss of fallability, fallability being the capability of the seal to remain in contact with the shaft or range of uh, application condition. The dynamic runout versus the interference level here on the y-axis versus the temperature on the s-axis, on the x-axis. And for a constant speed, what this line here depicts is basically, uh, it's a boundary line where basically below the line, the seal remain in contact based on our, uh, let's say, analytical model. And above the line, uh, the contact is lost. So we basically, uh, with the contact being lost, the uh, we basically are able uh, we, the, we basically are able to um, to understand where, where what would be configurations that would be uh, dramatic for our, for our seals. Please remember this diagram as I will come back to this at a later stage in the presentation. Then what happens here is that as we increase the speed, remember again uh, the uh, ball experiment, uh, the area uh, that is basically uh, effective for the seal where the seal remains in contact starts to reduce. And this ultimately will lead to failure. And we are able to predict this analytically. So having a fast uh, response, allowing us to capture the transient dynamics of the seal with the effect of speed temperature assessed in seconds, really, because there is absolutely no computational time. Expect the fact that entering your parameters here. And uh, this allows, like I was saying, to evaluate the seal in real time and to respond to application changes uh, if need be. Of course, we. Uh, the question is how, 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 how let's say, uh, how good is the prediction of either the advanced simulation tool or the of the um, analytical model based on uh, versus the experimental uh, testing or versus the physical reality? Here, I would like to take a moment to show some validation. Um, and again, the line that you see here is basically the response of the model. So below the line, we are uh, the seal is in contact with the shaft in application. Above the line, the seal has lost contact. We are again uh, depicting on the y-axis the dynamic runout over the interference. And this is done for two dynamic runout here in this case, uh, over, a set, over a certain range of temperature. The round, uh, the circles basically uh, are uh, representing the test results uh, with the full round being the, uh, the case where the seal is in contact. And the same principle applies for the triangles and for the diamonds. So basically field diamonds means the seal is in contact according to our 2D seal virtual, SKF virtual seal simulation. And the diamonds when full is basically showing when the seal is also in contact for our SKF virtual seal in 3D. Um, with that being said, uh, you see here four graphs uh, of the, uh, with permutation of uh, two different material uh, versus two different speeds. And I would like to, to take a moment to just uh, allow you to have a look at the slide um, to see and uh, 
basically realize um, the agreement that we have between the models and the actual experimental data. Um, so we can see that whether we are talking about the analytical model, the 2D simulation or the 3D simulation, we are in quite good agreement with the actual um, experimental results. So this gives us confidence that we are actually doing the right thing when it comes to predicting transient dynamics with seals, whether we are doing it with advanced simulation or analytical modeling. Another, of course, important point to consider is the uh, friction of the seal. I was talking at the beginning of this presentation about the uh, highest demand on the lower friction for our application. And here, uh, a parameter that is crucial to be considered is, of course, the dry rubber friction or the dry polymer friction friction if we talk for example about polyurethane seals and what is important is to understand that there is no such thing as a friction coefficient per se yeah, the friction of uh, the dry friction of rubber being um, a very very varying uh, parameter uh, that is extremely influenced by speed as can be seen here but also by temperature and of course by normal load so uh, what we've been uh, spending efforts in uh, SKF uh, research and development is basically to understand this dry rubber friction. And if you look here at the tribometer characterization, we are now able to uh, replicate uh, with our internal models, basically the um, tribometer uh, material signature when it comes to friction. And since we know that uh, the friction, the dry rubber friction is basically uh, also a viscoelastic phenomenon that is coming from the excitation and the, um, let's say, um, the strain hysteresis response of the rubber against the uh, counterface asperities, we are able to use the viscoelastic models that we have in order to extrapolate the behavior and the signature in terms of friction of our, of our rubber for the dry part of the friction beyond what was characterized, allowing us to simulate and to predict in our virtual seals um, beyond what was indeed characterized initially. Once this dry rubber, is, uh, this dry rubber friction is understood, then uh, combined with the viscous shearing of the oil in place with the contact or with the oil, the lubricant in place in the contact, we are then able to predict the torque. The torque for the seal leading ultimately to uh, frictional heat and then uh, potentially to heat conductions and heat convections in the system, which we are uh, able to capture. And in order to do that, uh, we have developed, um, let's say, uh, an even more advanced uh, version of our SCAR virtual seal, uh, in addition to what I was showing for the transient dynamics uh, before, where we are basically able to over, via the combination of more than, um, than uh, 100 parameters, to predict uh, the uh, seal basically friction, but also the frictional uh, thermal heat generated uh, on the leap, for example, and then conducting, finally uh, dissipating through the seal, uh, and in some cases, if need be, all the way through the system. So then the question is also with this capability, how good are we when it compares to reality? And uh, we did some internal tests and here I'm showing an example. It's just a single case over many that were run internally. And what we can see here is basically for a certain speed cycle here in green going all the way to 1000 RPM. Uh, we have basically over a certain duration of time, uh, the friction torque response uh, in simulation versus what was measured in testing. Um, similarly, we placed different thermocouples around the seal to understand the temperature distribution. And I'm showing here an example around the garter spring area. So in this location, and you can have again with the same scale uh, in dark blue, um, basically what is the uh, the response uh, of the of the model versus the actual uh, test data. And I think we can agree that uh, in this case, but also in the others that are, I'm not able to show today, we are in quite good agreement with uh, with the actual experiment results. So then how do we use these capabilities? I would like now to go through a certain amount of examples to show the usefulness and the applicability of these virtual seal capabilities for what concerns the product uh, and, and see how we can use them to support our customers uh, uh, when it comes to the business. Um, for example, here is, a, is an example where low friction seals for electrical vehicle um, and needed basically uh, to be uh, made at a somewhat uh, lower cost for the uh, Chinese market. And uh, what was basically used here is uh, to use our virtual seal to uh, assess uh, the FKM candidate compounds. In this case, the green compound being the somewhat less expensive version uh, for this uh, low friction seal in order to understand what were the basically the temperature or thermal behavior 
be expected and whether or not uh, this, uh, let's say, less expensive uh, material could be candidate uh, for potential low cost solutions. As we can see here between uh, in this plot, temperature over time, we see only about 13 degrees uh, of temperature, underleaf temperature for the uh, alternative compound, giving us confidence that uh, with minimum effort, the uh, basically cost target should be able to be reached. Similarly, when we look at the uh, dynamic transient response, uh, ensuring that despite the change of the material from the baseline material in blue here towards the low cost uh, potential solution here in green, what was in important was to understand, of course, the transient dynamics of the seal since we are talking about 17,000 RPM. And we can see here that for both cases, the force remains above, uh, above zero. Uh, giving us the confidence that uh, we should see no uh, problems uh, in the field or uh, when it comes to dynamic followability of the seal against the uh, eccentricity and the rotation of the shaft at such speed. So with this, we are quite confident that we can move forward uh, with the alternative uh, compound uh, to move towards a low cost solution uh, dedicated to the Chinese market. Uh, another example I would like to share is basically a typical case where uh, discussing with customers that are facing, um, let's say, a low cost, a low temperature, sorry, low temperature uh, uh, challenges when it comes to dynamic followability, we often have the comment that uh, why wouldn't you just increase the garter spring load? And by increasing the garter spring load, then maintain the seal in contact despite the range of uh, low temperature or high speed that the seal would be uh, undergoing. And uh, here is a nice example uh, made by one of our product engineer in uh, product development engineer in, in the US, showing basically that uh, through our tool we can run a sensitivity analysis and show what are the most important important factors influencing in this case and for this transmission uh, the actual uh, followability of the seal. Here we can see that the compound and the actual dynamic runout are the most important factor. And we could basically discuss with our customers and explain that uh, increasing the load coming from the garter spring would simply not solve the problem at hand, since by increasing the garter spring load, uh, we can simply not compete at, uh, with the stiffness of the actual rubber at such a low temperature, since it is uh, basically exponentially uh, skyrocketing and that the rubber become, becomes even stiffer than the actual garter spring. So uh, we could save both parties expensive seal cold, te cold testing and uh, of course find different ways, uh, thanks to our expertise, but also our SCARF virtual seals to respond to the customer need. Another interesting example is when it comes to an industrial application uh, with a bore rotation in this case, where a customer was facing issue with competitor seals uh, for different reasons. One of them was basically uh, a clear leakage coming from a, a loss of contact, it seems, and the, the customer was interested by uh, the effect of rotational inertia onto the actual uh, leap force. And uh, so basically the virtual SK virtual seal was used to be able to uh, assess, first of all, the relaxation uh, coming over time uh, for this uh, um, uh, for this seal, but also once the, uh, let's say, centrifugal load were applied, how the force will basically decrease uh, the leap being left, uh, due to the uh, bore rotation in this application. So we clearly see that the force decreases. Nevertheless, uh, thanks to the followability uh, capabilities, we could then assess for this lower force whether or not the seal would then uh, remain in contact in application. And we could then demonstrate that there was no uh, risk whatsoever in this case for loss of followability. But we could also, underst by understanding the transient dynamics of the seal, uh, we can also uh, we could also eliminate for SKF designs basically uh, the um, the risk of so-called clocking, which is when the seal rotates in the bore uh, relative to the uh, inner uh, diameter of the seal, leading to rotation uh, inside the housing. So this was also confirmed not to be happening. And uh, uh, in this case, we could basically uh, uh, replace, since we had no issues whatsoever, the uh, competitor solution with an SKF design. Another nice example to show the applicability of uh, the application, sorry, of our SKF virtual seal is uh, something completely different in this case, actually an hydraulic application uh, where uh, there were some concerns about the effect of the cooling versus mounting sequence uh, in condition of application of minus 16.5 degrees centigrade. And uh, here, what was basically done was to understand 
uh, to run a small DOE with a different uh, different scenarios. Uh, for example, mounting the seal at ambient temperature and then cooling down, or mounting the seal at ambient temperature only, or then cooling down before assembling the seal. And uh, in order to understand the effect of uh, basically the different sequence onto the overall radial load and how do this could potentially relate uh, to, to future issues. And uh, here uh, we have uh, and we have basically the response uh, in the dashed line of uh, the actual uh, test measurements at minus 16.5 degrees centigrade versus the actual uh, SK virtual seal results. And then we can clearly see that there is a, quite a good agreement uh, between uh, the test data and the model prediction again, and despite the cold temperature uh, that goes below zero. What important, another important uh, effect that was to be considered was the amount of force that was lost for about 200 seconds in this case, which was to be considered uh, also by the product development in order to, um, let's say, supply the right solution to our customer. So um, here a nice example of how the tool can be applied basically in this case of virtual ceiling to uh, predict the low temperature behavior. And um, this SKI virtual seal is not only uh, to be applied or let's say applicable to seal only components, we can also study systems uh, when it comes, for example, in this case uh, to uh, thermal behavior uh, with the temperature generated by underleaf temperature coming from the frictional heat uh, of the seal, which is uh, oftentimes uh, responsible for most of the friction in an application, therefore a source of uh, a source of heat that is to be considered and most likely to be optimized. Giving here an example on of a truck hub unit for trucks and here, uh, let's say a hub bearing unit for cars. And uh, we can see uh, how basically between design A and design B, uh, we wanted to assess whether by modifying the design, either by removing some interference with the uh, flinger or by, uh, let's say, modifying the lip geometry, the temperature could be optimized at the system level. Uh, similarly, uh, for the THU, we wanted to understand what was uh, basically uh, for one of our customers, the torque generated by both seals in application, regardless of what's what happening with the rolling elements of the, the bearing in place. So the SK virtual seal can basically be also used for uh, system understanding um, to some extent. Um, if we can predict then these performance, um, um, let's say for a fresh sealed, we should be able, uh, and this is what we do today, uh, to understand what is the performance decay over time. In fact, as we understand that material are hardening with uh, the time of aging in application, but also that the stress relaxation is accelerated or that the wear is somehow also um, present in application, we can then uh, take into account for analytical model uh, what will be the decay of the performance. If you remember this diagram that we had initially uh, at the beginning when we discussed, uh, you probably recognize the area below the curve being the area where the seal remains in contact for a certain condition. If this was a working point at the actual temperature of 80 degrees, uh, where the seal would be uh, properly working in this case, as time is passing by, for example, at high temperature, uh, let's say for an NBR compound, for instance, um, this area becomes so small than the so-called uh, working point initially, uh, let's say uh, in the green area, then suddenly becomes a, becomes a failure. Um, becomes a failure point simply because over time the aging uh, the, the aging has basically taken place and challenging the seal behavior and this is basically a failing seal uh, now in application. So if we can uh, take this into account this means that we can basically use the SK virtual seal to predict the remaining time until seal failure and update this time based on changing application condition for example like I was saying based on remote monitoring uh, at the beginning of my presentation. Um, of course Accurate, this requires uh, good knowledge and updated application conditions, such as, for example, temperature eccentricity, transmitted by remote, conditor, remote monitoring. Um, and we cannot simply assume uh, what are these values. We need to basically be really connected to the application to be able to predict what will be the uh, so-called long-term behavior. Here, I'm giving an example of uh, the prediction of the model versus basically the test data and uh, where we run basically a life cycle uh, test all the way to failure of the seal. And uh, we can see what is the agreement uh, for two different dynamic runout over a certain range of temperature uh, between the actual model in, uh, let's say, in a dark gray versus the test results with the um, uh, error bar showing as well that the model prediction is within the uh, acceptable tolerance. What is also interesting is that we see the decrease over time uh, sorry, over the temperature range uh, of this life expectancy, or let's say this uh, lifetime in number of hours. As we increase the temperature, uh, lifetime is dropping. 
This means that if we are able, like I was showing earlier with the temperature, to predict what will be the effect of the, uh, the temperature changing in application, we can then update the uh, time remaining until seal failure. And we can then fulfill what I was introducing earlier, um, our SKF REP uh, vision, which is basically to use the virtual seal uh, to send real-time adjustment based on feedback loops coming from the real application. So we can then calculate uh, things such as uh, remaining useful performance over time. With this, I end the part about the uh, basically uh, virtual seal product, and I would like now to uh, go over the what we call SK virtual seal production, because again, we believe that uh, it's not only about predicting the behavior of the of the product, but also about the manufacturing process to used um, to manufacture this product. Of course, the starting point is always the same. We need to ensure that we have the right, the proper curing kinetics and the proper viscosity measurement over a certain range of shear rate. So what we do is we use a rubber process analyzer in different condition, either at the constant, uh, basically frequency and constant amplitude of shear uh, over a certain duration of time at a given fixed high temperature in order to understand the curing kinetics and how basically the thermal setting is activated into the rubber material. Um, we also use the same equipment, but in a different setup where we uh, will change the uh, frequency corresponding then to the shear rate in order to understand what is the evolution of the viscosity over a shear rate um, uh, range. With this in place, we are then able to basically predict uh, following the, uh, the workflow that I'm presenting here, the behavior uh, in our injection processes, injection, injection molding processes, starting from the press all the way to the passing through the mold geometry in order to obtain the mold cavity and with the right material rheology, we are then capable of predicting the behavior such as potential underfill, like we basically see on this picture, or uh, let's say uh, amount of scorch in uh, the process for a given pressure over time and so forth and so on. Prediction of the melt front time or potential voids to be expected in the application in the in, in the process so that we have to correct for these. And here I'm showing an example of how we basically can compare the simulations result uh, versus the actual experiments where we can see the correspondence in the good agreement between the different region where defects were expected based on the virtual seal production and were in fact actually obtained in reality or let's say observed in reality. Here I'm also depict depicting the correspondence, correspondence uh, um, over a validation that we carried out for our tools for injection molding between the uh, basically um, uh, the experimental data here in blue versus the prediction for our SKF seal uh, virtual production. And I think we can agree that uh, over a number of cases, they are in quite good agreement. Similarly, but more challenging, uh, we also have the capabilities to predict the compression molding uh, process. Uh, in the same manner, we are able to uh, predict the melt front, but also different type of uh, potential defect and potential challenges in application. This was somewhat more challenging and uh, we had to we had to collaborate with external parties and we are today very happy to be able to have these capabilities which we um, as we can see here are happy to uh, to see is now in quite good agreement with the actual physical experimental behavior because the challenge on compression molding is basically that we are moving different uh, across different phases from solid to fluidic back to solid and is uh, somewhat more complex uh, to understand and to basically uh, physically model uh, compared to uh, a injection molding process. Again, still keeping in mind the uh, rotating equipment performance uh, plan that uh, we believe in in SKF, uh, we needed analytical quick solutions to be able to capture the variation uh, from one material to another uh, on the fly in real time to be able to bring response to our manufacturing presses and our man manufacturing production channels so that we can basically adjust the different parameters to fulfill part efficiency, uh, sorry, process efficiency and part quality. This is now in place uh, through a quick tool that replicates basically uh, the prediction of the optimum curing and filling time for a given, uh, let's say, molding process. One quick example I would like to show uh, of application is a case where we had a request from a motorbike uh, customer that needed a rear suspension pivot seal. And uh, we had a challenge here because we needed to, we needed to inject the rubber through the metal insert channels in order to be able to uh, basically uh, mold the tulips in place uh, on the seal. So quite a complexity of the channels internal to the metal insert because that would lead to then uh, in principle very high shear rate and uh, the challenge was also whether or not this could be filled within the available pressure of the press uh, that we had 
on the prototyping shop. Uh, the good news is we uh, um, we uh, were able to basically simulate in our SK virtual serial production um, this process and to make, uh, let's say, the recommendation to our uh, manufacturing sites on how to basically make these prototypes. And uh, as you can see on these pictures, these prototypes were then made in, in on time to be tested in field. And uh, we are now very, uh, very pleased that the, basically the 2021 bike fleet uh, for our customer uh, initially requesting this product is now uh, equipped with SKF PIVO seals using the process that is now basically in place. Um, another example is uh, now going back to compression molding. Another example is uh, using the SK virtual seal production to be able to predict uh, what would be the best strategy to use to mold a certain seal. Here you see basically two configuration, uh, a three plate mold versus a two plate mold uh, with an upside down uh, molding for different reasons. And uh, such a solution allows us to basically look at the effect of different molding scenarios, for example, in terms of uh, um, velocity fields around the uh, crucial leap area, but also, for example, uh, the stress state uh, around the leap area, which we want to be able to control in a proper way to ensure, part, to, to ensure part quality, still maintaining the efficiency of our processes. So uh, you can see clear differences between the two processes and uh, the tool. Uh, here's one example of how this uh, scavenger seal production allows us to make the right choices to reach efficiency and right part quality. This brings me to my conclusion after having talked about the SKF seal uh, production. And uh, if you remember, we started with uh, virtual seal and virtual production, being able to virtually assess our seal in something similar to a virtual test bench. And um, also uh, having a virtual production, allowing us to make the right choices in terms of parameter setting for our presses, whether we are talking about compression molding or injection molding. Um, for the future, we plan on working uh, on connecting better this virtual seal platform with this virtual production platform in order to reach basically the optimum uh, set of parameters and condition for our real production. Um, ultimately leading to the right choices uh, for the real seal to be provided to our customer. And uh, we are quite frankly, uh, quite ahead with, uh, with, with this type of uh, capabilities. However, um, as you could see, a lot of the interactions between the virtual production and the real production were actually still human based. Um, having to use a model, choosing a set of parameter, and then giving uh, feedback to the production to optimize basically their settings. Um, we believe that in order to make this sustainable and to actually reach the right value for a customer, we need to develop more uh, API based automation and interaction, moving away a little bit from the human interaction and having systems working together using the models in place to be able to optimize the parameters reaching efficiency uh, for end the production and the seal product that we supply to our customers. Of course, what I believe remains as a big challenge is to basically put in place remote monitoring, and this cannot be done in a generalized manner, to be very honest. Uh, it has to be done in strong collaboration with customers that are interested, since the right application should be uh, basically chosen with the right monitoring in place for the right purpose. Uh, and here uh, we have already collaboration starting uh, in order to be able to basically uh, learn how to um, do this in an optimum way. For SKF seals, this is quite new. For our colleagues in the uh, coming from uh, the bearing side, uh, this is quite ahead already, and we are learning a lot from there in order to, in order to accelerate uh, the process of development in this area. With this in place, we can then make full potential and maximize the effect of our capabilities, whether we talk about the digital twin product or the digital twin manufacturing process, ultimately leading to what we call the um, assessment for the digital twin performance. Again, remembering that the performance for us today does not necessarily mean uh, only the seal product performance, but also how do we make this actual product with uh, the right manufacturing efficiency, with the right cost and the right part quality. Finally, using the cloud-based online platform uh, with this set of uh, virtual tool, we believe that we can then basically just increase even further our value proposition for our customers at the SKF seals level uh, in order to do what we believe should be done, which is more than just transactional supply of products in application. 
with this, I end my talk. And uh, let's say I, on behalf of SKF SEALs, I would like to thank you all for your attention.